You hit my son. For God is protractor. I don't want you doing it. Until we get equal pay, this needs a leader, someone to inspire the girls. Well, you can do this, and you should. Buddy, out! What's going to happen to do with me? Prime Minister, I don't think you appreciate the situation. We need to tread carefully. You're the best man in my cabinet. I often say that. It's a freak. What's going on? This is being on strike. You run out of cash and you end up screaming at each other. And you tell her to get her finger out. It's gone on long enough. A first class honours degree from one of the finest universities in the world. And my husband treats me like I'm a fool. Don't give up. Equal pay for women is right. That's my girl. If Mrs. Castle says no deal, how will you cope then? Cope with women. Now, don't ask such stupid questions. Just the original footage and stuff. So, so, uh, and this is what you always end up wondering: how much of that is real, and which are the bits that you just completely add in or ad lib, or just flip the timing round and all the rest. Well, I'm always really, um, I'm really, really careful. It's like again, like this, the, the last. It's weird. I've done. I've got a thing coming out in um, coming out about six weeks called Burton Dickey. So if you can get a chance to see that, please do it. But it's going to be like the BBC sort of Olympic film, and it's about that's a true story. These two rowers in 1948, and I actually met one of the guys there when he uh, who was still alive at the time when I interviewed him. And and with that, as with this, at all the facts are absolute. Where, where there are facts, they're absolutely smack uh, in the right place. And, and similarly, so with this one, the, 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 the biggest issue was uh, Barbara Castle because, the, you know, the, she did certain things at certain times. She, she met the women, you know, so, so what I'll do is, I, you know, they didn't, no, actually they did drink some sherry there, but mostly they had tea. So we've got them having whiskey and that's fine. But, but what, I, what I tend to do is, because I feel very uncomfortable about making up um, pe pe people's lives, you know, you can't, you can't muck with people's lives, I don't think. And so, so, so all the Barbara Castle stuff there is, is absolutely bang on the money. And, and also all the responses of the Fords, uh, there, was, there was a book written by a guy called Sandra Meridine, which was all about the, the dispute. So from the Ford point of view, that's all accurate. And the union stuff is accurate as well. But what I didn't want to do, the, 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 the main strike leader was a woman called Rosie Boland, who sadly had died by the time I started researching, <coughs> so I, I couldn't speak to her anyway. Um, but, but even if I had been able to, I was... What, what, what the story lacked to a certain extent was a big spine and a big, a big uh, kind of traditional narrative running right through the middle of it. And that had some, uh, and th that kind of, that would work on a kind of human and emotional level. So, so in order, and I needed to invent that. So basically, and that became really the stuff between her and her husband, obviously, and the stuff between George and, and, George and Connie and, and, and the stuff there, of which a lot has been cut, sadly, which I think would, would make it a much better film. Um, but, um, so, so what, and, and, and I made, I, I kind of invented this woman, Rita, because and she, all the things she talks about, the situation she's in, the political, real politics, are accurate and, and, and true of other women. But because I wanted to then sort of play emotionally with, with her and where she was, I, I kind of invented her as a, as a, as a character, because I just felt more comfortable I, I'd, have been, I'd have been really awkward. I mean, you see, you know, we met the ladies and we interviewed them all. They were fantastic. And there were, there were lots of stories that were, um, were incredibly emotional, but were also, you could just tell that they were, they were kind of difficult for them. And I, and I, didn't, I just didn't fancy put, pulling them about. So, so what I tend to do is I tend to put the walls up, the, the real <coughs> politic, and then just try and invent with, with, within that. And also, you kind of I think Dennis Potter said, you. You tend to plough the same furrow, I think, as a writer in terms of um, the things that interest you. And sometimes, it, it, I, I, I always find it quite interesting that you, <coughs> it doesn't matter where, where you are or where somebody drops you or where you drop yourself in terms of a topic, you find yourself somehow going back to those things. And again, if, if those things that you want to explore are, are going to be difficult for the, for the real life characters, then I think it's best to just invent them. 
So Re Rita and O'Grady was a name you made up. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I want. I can't, there was a reason I went with that name as well, but I can't remember. It's something very sixties, but. <laughs> So we have, sorry, there are, there are two there. So I'll take you first and then you next. Okay. Yeah. I mean, really, this is following on from that. Um, I'm old enough to actually have come from there. I remember my dad taking me to see one of the Tagland women speaking. Oh, wow. On a tour at Lavington. Wow. The story is very, is written very much of today, I think, rather than as it was. Um, the Barbara Castle thing was very interesting. And so you mentioned Margaret Thatcher. Because Margaret Thatcher wouldn't have had such an easy ride of uh, destroying the trade union movement had it not been for Margaret Thatcher, uh, for Barbara Castle. And of course, like the Dagenham strike was what they called in those days a wildcat strike. It wasn't supported by the official unions. And Barbara Castle's main aim, and she was quite open about all her cynicism, was to actually get the unions to control the membership again and get rid and stop these. And that, and that was part and parcel of it. By introducing legislation about unions, that allowed that made gave Thatcher a much easy ride uh, in the, in destroying the unions. But I think that there was a lot. Like you mentioned Murdoch earlier on, you had the guy from Ford's, and when he meets with Barbara Castle, you seem to be perpetuating this idea that there are these mysterious capitalists who would be wielding power and all this sort of stuff. Like you know, and I think it is. A lot of it is, is, is very much more of the t today mm. rather than it was of the 60s or the early 70s. I worked in a, on a women's section when I, was a, when I first went into thing and it was in Lockheed's on, uh, on the machines. Mm. So the, the same thing was still there and that's just like seven years after the Dagenham women, women went on strike. Yeah. So I think they, were still getting, they were still getting the lo low pay and such like. I think still are now. Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, They're just classes as different as yeah. different skills this time. But I mean, the same. I mean, you see, you still, you saw, you had that. Um, you know, th I think the reflection of the unions. It, it seemed to be that what you were playing, what you were doing, was playing the, the heroic women off against the dumb, stupid men. Even with the Barbara Castle thing, that was that was done as well, which I think is. I was trying not to do that because I mean Henry Friedman, who was, as you probably know, was yeah. the union leader at the time and was the guy who was pushing for them to go for equal pay. Fifteen unions representing the women at the time. Friedman saying, Friedman a communist, uh, you know, saying, and my favourite line in the thing is a union man saying, you know, we've got to remember who we are, who we speak for first as a union, that's the Communist Party. Friedman was quite upfront about that. And one of the things I was very keen to do, again, for this same, this, this sort of idea of veracity, was that the producers wanted the weren't happy with the fact that Bob Hoskins character, who kind of is, is, is sort of Friedman, but, but again has been, you know, has been pulled and, and pushed a bit. The producers were very keen that the women should arrive at that moment of we, we need equal pay off their own back. Because they didn't, and they were being, they were being uh, kind of encouraged, but it, it, was still, it was still their battle. And I mean, interestingly enough that, you know, the one thing that isn't in there, because it wouldn't make a great film, is the fact that you know, when I first interviewed the women, um, I sort of said, you know, you, you got equal pay, that's fantastic, they went, yeah, whatever. Because what they were interested in always was the grading issue, and that wasn't settled until 1984, obviously. Um, and, and they were still, so even when, even when Ford agreed to give them the equal pay, they wouldn't shift them from that uh, unskilled um, grading thing. So, 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 so that, that, unfortunately, that got shunted a bit. But in terms of the men, I hoped that because I was very keen not to do what you said, and I, I hoped it, we'd kind of avoided that, or I'd avoided that, insofar as I wanted to try and be truthful about the situation in terms of there was a lot of, there was a lot of manoeuvring going on within the, union, within the union movement at the time, as you know, and that to try and suggest that, that the women were, not, not that, not that, the, not, not that the, the, the men were buffoons, because Bob Hoskins is just the opposite. I mean, he, he's, he's kind of working very much within the system, and, as, as Freeman did, he was quite upfront about it. Um, but the, the, and also the same with the husband. For me, it was really important that the husband uh, was, represent, was representative of, of, of men of my sex um, in a way that he, you know, he, kind of, he can't quite understand at first. And he doesn't feel he's like, a lot of men were, let's be honest, in those days. You know, they were out in the pop all the time and they were a bit fisty and, and that kind of stuff. So that, 
So that I was trying to. So what I was trying to do was to to represent the the what, what I thought was truthfully the, the the fact that there was all sorts of kind of manoeuvring going on going on within the union, um, and and but uh, but but that the men didn't seem because I didn't I don't I didn't want them to be um, to just to seem like the women were all good and the men were all bad because it's, <coughs> it's just not interesting. So so I mean if it's come across like that that's it, that's not. Uh, it's not intention because certainly I'm not. I, I just think people are more complex than that, you know. And the other thing, but to, to the other final point, which is that um, what was really interesting, writing some of that latter stuff, was that. And I think it's something that we maybe think about now. It, it feels very modern, in terms of what the what the American guy and they did send somebody over and they did have files on everybody. Which you know we'd never heard of that in this country before. It was kind of like yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's how I remember it. Yeah, and it was just, but they, they came over and, and when he when he says when Tuli says to um, to Barbara Castle, you know, uh, hold the line with me, or we'll take our car production yeah. elsewhere. That's what happened. Now then, what's really awkward about that from my point of view, because of my politics, is I'm going, I'm going, but you you have to support what they're doing because it's a moral position. But the reality, and, and it also was a nonsense to say that the, you know, the, the, the weight of the wages would make, make everything collapse. That was, that was just fabrication. But however, the fact is that as stuff, every, every, as everything's gone to the Far East, you know, or, or a lot of production's gone to the Far East, where wages are all cheap, we have, you know, a lot of industry, our industry has got shafted. And, that was, and it's really hard to write that, because in a sense, he's, set, he's, he's telling the truth, but for the wrong reasons. And, that, and, and I felt quite uncomfortable doing that, because it just had a... Because you know you, you can look, as you say, you can then look forward yeah. 40 years, can't you? Whatever, so... Um, you can't do that when you're writing it, can you? It's like Hilary Mantle says, she writes in the present tense yeah. with the historical novels yeah. because her characters don't know what's going to happen. No, so when you're writing a drama like that, you can't think what's going to happen. No, you absolutely... characters didn't know. No, no, you're absolutely not. And, and you, you try and keep... You, do, you absolutely stay in that present, like she, exactly like she does. And, and you have to sort of... Everything has to be de facto. It has to be, you know, this is how it is in this world at this present time. But at the same time, what you are always aware of when you're writing, of course, sometimes you just get those moments when you go, Oof, you just realise that you've got a kind of prescience. Um, and, and then that's a bit weird, you know? Just, just an odd feeling. So you've been waiting, yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, it's a bit of a two-part question. Sure. Um, I was just wondering if there was any women you had to thank for being able to write strong women so well. Slash, would you identify as a feminist? Would I? Yeah. I would, yeah. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I was brought up by my, um, by my mum and my sisters. Uh, my, 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 um, my auntie, well, my, my mum Edna. I can tell you a generational thing here. Edna, Stella, Vera, and Esther uh, were my aunties and, and my mum. And um, because my dad was off scrapping all the time and wasn't around, um, uh, and I'm two older sisters, so. Um, yeah, and I've got two daughters now, two 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 young girls. So I, I've always kind of I've just I've always been around really strong women, and and have always sort of just who've kind of uh, who've always sort of empowered me and each other. I'm just going to tell you a quick story. I went to um, I wrote a thing. The thing that's taken me the longest ever to get on ten years. I was saying sixty nine drafts is my record for a project. So I went through sixty nine versions of this bloody script over ten years. And it was this thing about bomber command and. Um, and it was really weird because I finally got the money together to, to make it. And, um, and I went up to this airfield in Lincolnshire and, um, and we were struggling to get any help because there's only two, two of these planes, two Lancaster bombers that fly that left in the world. And, and uh, we couldn't get near one, which was RF1. There was one in Canada which we tried to buy, but it was 16 million quid. And we had two million total budget. And um, so we were a bit knackered. But then there was one in this that these two chicken farmers uh, own up in Lincolnshire. And their, their brother was... Uh, they've made lots of money from packing a lot of chickens in a small space, um, and um, and they, as a result, they kind of maintain this this plane in memory of their their, their dead brother, and they're in, they're in the sixties now, in fact, late, older than that now, and um, but they were being a bit funny about whether they'd let us use this and whether we could use the runway and all the rest of it, and I was I was sitting talking to them, and um, brother, as, as you two ladies are there, the, the two brothers Harold and, and I can't remember his brother Albert, I think Harold and Albert Panton. I was explaining what I wanted to do, and they were being really, really cagey. And we were in, a, we were in what was the cafe of this, this museum. 
uh, where because they, they opened it up to the public and uh, it was the old officers mess and all around the room there was thousands and literally thousands of pictures of, of people from the war you know RAF personnel as I'm talking to these boys I see my dad's face staring out the wall a picture I've never seen before and uh, I went oh it's my dad that's him there and we went and had a look at this thing and, and there he was age 20 and uh, they said oh 50 squad I said yeah that's the one he was that's my dad and, um, and then they were suddenly really, really helpful. And they, they took, but it was really weird. I sat in this plane, and um, sat in this little plane, and it's kind of, you see the, the pilot spits there, and the, you can touch the fuselage on the other side. My dad was a navigator, which is ironic, because he used to get lost going to Wales, where the family was. <laughs> but, um, but, and I sat in, this, sat in this thing, and it's utterly terrifying. It's just, it's, just, it's, it's a flying bomb bay, basically. And um, I remember I got in a car, um, and I can remember the only thing he'd ever talked to me about about the war was he said, you know, he said he used to, he said you could you you go off, and I realised it's what sent him mad. You go off, it could take you nine hours to do a round trip, but then you could be back at home having tea with with my grandma four o'clock in the afternoon. And of course, so it wasn't like you went off on the with the navy and you went off for a year or two, or you went off across Europe. You went off for eight hours, nine hours, and you came home and you got on with your life, and that's what sent them all mad. And and that was. That was this, this, anyway, that's such a terrible digression, but it was interesting. But that, that was part of that was what was left out of this film. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was all about that because I was interested in also the character I was really interested in was it, it I think it's easier to be a revolutionary when you're young. Yes. Uh, and, you know, yeah. and I think yeah. it's, I think the thing from Connie's point of view was to say to, to was to be able to say to, to Sally Hawkins' character, if you're beautiful and you're young and you're fit and yet it's just somehow slightly easier to put yourself out there than it is when you're a middle-aged woman who's got a dependent husband. And there was kind of, and I think that was, I just think that was a really interesting thing to explore, and it's just not really there anymore. Mm. Although it is noticeable that the, the women were young and beautiful, weren't they, the ones who sort of... Yeah, they were, mu yeah. I mean, I, you know, I have to say, because you couldn't actually get on the line to do 21. Um, so, and we had a couple in there who were, 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 were younger than that. Um, yeah. Uh, no, Mark, you could be later. So over here. Well, I'll, I'll just follow along because you, you had quite a star-studded cast there. And I just was wondering, when you were writing the script, did you imagine that it would be you know, acted out by such a high-profile cast? Not, not really, but, but I'm quite lucky. I've, over the years, I've always got, I've always had really, really good acting in my stuff because um, like Pete, Pete Postlewaite, Geraldine's done stuff, done stuff before. When we did Women in Love, with Rory Kinnear and Rosamond again. And I think it's because I'm, I'm quite, for a, for a screenwriter, I'm quite written, I'm quite theatrical. My, my background's kind of in theatre, but I'm just not very good at it. Um, and so it kind of, and in fact, I'm, I'm doing more plays now gradually, and I think I'm learning how to do it a bit better. But, but so, uh, so I think that, that there's so little dialogue. You know, you look at you look at the Last Temptation of Christ, which is one of my favourite movies, and it's you know it's two hour over two, two and a quarter hour script, and it's 30, the film. It's a thirty page script. So in terms of the words, you know, in, in my stuff they get to say a lot of words basically, and they quite like that. So I, I was always hopeful that I'd get I'd get quite serious actors, you know. But you know you know you never know quite who you're going to get, you know, because sometimes and also the other thing is. Sometimes people say things to you, and they, and it's awful because they're really excited. And they say, "We're thinking of X," and you go, "What?" <laughs> um, and I had that with a. I tell you, the thing that I've got coming on in a bit is interesting because I've got a part that I've written for Robbie Coltrane, who I, who I know well enough to sort of say, "Look, I've written this part for you up for it. It's only a little small part." And um, and, and he went, "Yeah, yeah, I do." And um, and then they cast um, John Bird. Now, if you think of Robbie Coltrane just physically. And John Bird, you've got a really interesting thing going on there. And you know what do you do? Then then it's strange. <laughs> yes. I just want to go back to what you said before about some of the stuff that didn't go into the final film. And it's about that kind of the process of the writing. To what degree is the film kind of, I suppose, in your mind, from where you started out, um, is a change, which inevitably I think it, it would. But how do you kind of deal with that along the way about certain things that you'll push for or certain compromises? And, and how do you then, I suppose, in a way, still retain ownership 
of that when, when the final cut is made, if you like. It's really hard that, you know, and, and I find that we, films, film's different again for me because I'm, I'm not, you know, I've written a couple of features, one that's sang without trace, one that's done reasonably well. And, and you know, touch wood if I've got another couple coming out. If, hopefully if they do all right, I might get a bit more, say, with telly, I, I produce most of my telly now, so I at least exec it. And so that means I choose, at the basic level, I choose the director normally. So that makes a big, big difference because if, if, if you're working with a director, like, uh, you know, who, who's kind of, not that, not that you want them just to literally film what's on the page, because you don't want that. You do want them to, obviously, you want them to get inside it and, and make it live. And, and certainly when we did uh, Women in Love, there was a, the, 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 I, I was actually interested in one director and the producer said, look, you should see this, this woman and she was fantastic, she's an artist and she'd just finished doing a, a fine art degree and she'd film as her final piece. And, and, uh, she was, and she was really spiky and, and, want, and was questioned a lot and it was, she was magnificent. And, but it's just that you still have those meetings beforehand. The trouble with film is very often is that you, you can, um, you know, can just be given to somebody. And, and it's very interesting because I think Nigel who directed this is a, is a, is a, is a brilliant director, and he, but it's very interesting because he's very clear and he would say to me, uh, well, I start to think of it like a tailor. I used to, it was the way I used to kind of, if I ever did have days when I was finding a bit of a challenge, he used to say, okay, he's decided we're making a suit with wider lapels and bell bottoms. You know, we're still making a suit, but it's not the three piece I thought it was. And, and that can be really hard. And, but in terms of this one, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I can still stand by this because it's sort of, I reckon it's about 80% where I'd want it to be. There's just a little bit more, um, but there, there have been things I've done that have been really, really, really hard. I did a, I did a thing, um, the, the, worst, the worst experience I've had of that um, was, was I did a show called A Thing Called Love, a series for the BBC a few years ago with um, Paul Nichols and, and, and um, Liz White. And I, and I thought it was a really, some of my best work I'd ever done. And uh, we, we had a, we, we had a, the, the last episode um, was, we, we'd had, it was getting more and more, it was getting more and more difficult as, as we went through the process. And then we hit the buffers on the second to last episode where it was all about, the, the, it, was, it was a series about love and sex and it was, uh, it should have been called Love and Sex but the BBC wouldn't let us, so it's called a thing called Love. No sex again. No sex again, <laughs> but, but it was about love and it was about sex, beast with two backs, and gender, you know, love and gender and sex and gender. And there was a scene in which, in the fifth episode, a guy, uh, and it was based on a true story, a mate of mine who's, who's gay and he picks up, he picks up straight men, he goes to the, let me just tell you the story quickly, no, he, he goes, to a, goes to the roughest, most kind of heterosexual bar in, in Cardiff where he lives. Uh, he waits till he finds a businessman usually on his own, away at working, buys him a few beers, they start, you always talk about the women, excuse me, I say look at her, she's fantastic for you know. Get bevved up, then he'll say, do you want to come back to my house, watch a few blueies, you know, get a few tinnies in. Absolutely, they go back, put some heterosexual porn on, enjoy all of that. Then he says, um, the, the, the guy will always say, I should go now. And he goes, ah, oh, it's ridiculous, it's two in the morning, you'll never get a taxi, stay here. He makes him a bed up on the sofa. He even gets to the stage where he'll go out the room, be switching the light off. And then he'll go, oh, this is daft, I've got a bed in here. Don't we so they go to bed, shag like idiots all night. At which point, the next morning, the bloke, straight man, will always wake up and say, my head, I can't remember a thing of what happened last night. So anyway, so I basically dramatised this. And the, I'd have to say, I'm not, but there were, it was five executives, they were all women, they were all straight women, a certain age, and they said, um, they said, okay, well, where's the scene where we explain that he's gay? I said, he's not gay, he's straight. He said, no, no, we've got to have the scene. I said, well, he's not, he's just somebody who will shag anything, a hole in the ground, he'd do it. Um, and they said, no, 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 we can't have that. I said, look, it's not, I made this up. This happens, right? So on, uh, back and forth it went, back and forth it went. And, um, and, I, and they finally, we can't, I sort of got away with it. And then, but what they did the best is, on the next episode, they just, there was a big scene right at the end, which was a funeral oration, which they just said, no, we're not having it. You're not ending a big series at the BBC with a five page soliloquy, basically. And, and I can remember it went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, and I just refused to do uh, any more work on it. And, and I was going to take my name off it and all this kind of, and it got really, really horrible. And I can remember 
they, they, they just said, well, we will just rewrite it if you don't rewrite it. We will just put characters in it. So, well, you can take my name off it and that's it, forget it. And, um, and I, at that stage, was really, I did actually have a, I remember I, I come in from working abroad and came in and, and the producer rang me up and said, um, we're changing, we're filming the ending tomorrow and we're not using your version. And I said, you, you, you said, you do that, that, that's it. I won't, I will never ever do any more work if you do that. I said, you can't do that. She said, she said, I said, and they said, I can't talk to you about it anymore. I said, well, you're the producer. You've got to be able to talk to me about it. No, I'm not allowed to talk to you about it. Um, and it was just kind of Orwellian, you know, this ridiculous sort of situation. And um, so, and I can remember stopping the car, as you do, and bursting into tears, and then realising I was in the fast lane of the M1 between East <laughs> Airport and Nottingham, with all these cars zooming up the inside, pipping, and I thought, I've gone a bit funny here. And, um, but, you know, and I have to just say this, this... This scene, and, and in the end, I, I, one time I really throw my t toys out the, 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 the cop. Um, we filmed this thing, and it's the finest thing I've ever written. And, it's, and I got a call after it went out from somebody at Old Day Hospital saying, can we use it as grief counselling for, for people who've lost whose children have died? And, and for me, that was the, the greatest vindication that this, this thing worked, and it was what it was, and it had to be like that. So there are, there's odd times when you just, but you have to keep your powder dry, I reckon, for them moments. And then other times where you just have to think, as I say, it's just wider lapels and bell bottoms.